said I'm very thrilled to be here and I'm going to um, talk to you about a scientific approach to uh, looking at uh, spirit communication technology. And I should briefly give you a little brief preamble here because it's meaningful. Leslie asked me to give a presentation to you and I was reminded of the presentation Leslie asked me to give for his 65th birthday at Canyon Ranch which he titled A Scientific Look at Energy Vortexes. Um, and in honor of Leslie's consistent encouragement and support of visionary science, I created this new lecture titled A Scientific Look at Spirit Communication Technology. And this is actually the first time that this specific lecture will be given. So this is very, very special. So this is an overview. I think I'll make this, the screen bigger so you can see it. Um, so part one says, what do you believe about this controversial topic? Part two is three areas of established afterlife science. Then in part three, we'll look at extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and what kind of extraordinary evidence we have for this work. Then we'll go back to the, the dual screen um, and we'll, we'll, um, I'll put now the full large screen. So. What do you believe? When Albert Einstein was asked the question, um, do you believe in immortality? He said, no, and one life is enough for me, um, which of course is a, a very amusing comment. And there are three different approaches that people typically have to this topic. One is that we're, we're skeptical. We're convinced that it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust, case closed, like the uh, well-known skeptic Michael Shermer. Or we may be a... Uh, an unsure agnostic, such as Bersman Ratzel, who wrote the book, The Will to Doubt, and we're unsure whether or not there's life after death. And finally, we might be a certain believer, such as John Edward of Crossing Over, who was a famous medium who I had the privilege of testing before he had his best-selling television show called Crossing Over. Now, what I would like to propose is that what you try to do is leave your beliefs at the door, so to speak. In other words, let's learn about the contemporary science and then consider how your historical beliefs might change in light of this new scientific knowledge. And before we do so, I would like to just mention one comment and that is the, uh, the, the information that Leslie read to you about my, this early experience that I had when I was in college, uh, where uh, uh, both my wife, then wife and I, life were saved um, through a, a strange instance. That story uh, was written, it was included in a book I wrote called The G.O.D. Experiments. And that experience actually had nothing to do with my actually starting on this journey. Um, it was uh, uh, taken out of context and then falsely cited in Wikipedia, at, at which point it then was circulated. Uh, the whole issue of, of, of accurately communing inf communicating information is something that's very relevant to me, as you will see as we go through this presentation. All right, so anyway, there are three areas of, of research, uh, extensive research, all pointing to the idea that consciousness survives physical death. The first are what are called near-death experiences. You may have been heard of this as one of the most famous books, Conscious Beyond Life, The Science of Near-Death Experiences by a distinguished cardiologist, um, where people have physically died and then been resuscitated and report having extraordinary experiences. The second is the area of reincarnation, um, with a very distinguished book called Life Before Life, a scientific investigation of children's memories of past lives by Dr. Jim Tucker. Um, and the third area is research that I had the privilege to work on. And this book was actually published almost 20 years ago. Can you imagine that in 2002 called The Afterlife Experiments, Breakthrough Scientific Evidence for Life After God, uh, Life After Death. That was an amusing slip where I was, um, uh, essentially forced by the totality of the evidence to come to the conclusion that not all mediums were frauds and that some were real. And so on my own personal journey, I went from an educated skeptic 
I was taught by my parents, it was ashes to ashes, dust to dust, case closed. And I was trained by Western science to believe that the material world created consciousness and therefore when our bodies died, our consciousness and, uh, and memories and personalities died, case closed. I then went from that to being a, an unsure agnostic and exploring alternatives to finally an evidence-based believer. And I did more than a decade of single-blinded, double-blinded, and triple-blinded experience with experiments with mediums. And here's four of the books that I published in this. Now, what I'm about to share with you, which is part three, which has to do with spirit communication technology, uh, truly addresses the question of, well, in general, how do we know whether something's true or not? And as you know, we live in a, in a time when misinformation is the rule and not the exception, practically. Um, we see this in social media, including on things like Wikipedia, or we see it in politics. And uh, we recently published a book called The Case for Truth, Why and How to Find Truth. Now, this is with Alan Borey, who's an attorney, myself, and Victor Smith, who's a professional editor. Um, now, Carl Sagan, who many of you may remember, who was a distinguished astronomer and skeptic, he was the one that said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, and I call this the Sagan ethic. And it turns out that ethic, you can make even more broadly to state extraordinary claims require extraordinary ethics. So if I'm gonna propose something such as our consciousness continues after we die, and not only that, that technology is going to be not only able to demonstrate this scientifically, but ultimately result in a practical technology. That extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence and ethics in terms of doing so honestly and responsibly. This is a collage of images of uh, my laboratory, uh, which is at a medical complex off the main campus at the University of Arizona. And you can see various laboratory rooms with different kinds of equipment. This is my office. And I first published research using technology in 2010 in a scientific journal peer reviewed called Explore. It used this device here, which is called the silicon photomultiplier device. It detects single photons of light in a pitch black environment. And working with Evidential research mediums, uh, we would invite specific hypothesized spirit participants or collaborators to either enter the chamber with the light type box that contained this photomultiplier on some trials, five minute trials, and it would count the number of photons in the pitch black, like this bar here, the one on the left, hopefully you can see the cursor, versus the shorter bar, which were an equal number of trials which were baselines or controls. So we had spirit intention trials and controls. And you can see, and this was the second of the three experiments, that this bar is double the height of this one, statistically significant uh, for someone who we called Sophia. Um, here's another experiment that was done with a, an individual that we called Harry. Again, that same effect, double the number of, of detected photons when he was reportedly inside the box versus when he was not. And although we did not mention this uh, in the paper per se 10 years ago, this Harry actually referred to this individual here. And some of you may recognize him. And yes, that looks like Harry Houdini. Talk about an extraordinary claim requiring extraordinary evidence. Now, Harry Houdini said anyone who believes in magic is a fool. Um, and I couldn't uh, agree with him more, um, even though I love magic. Uh, I know it's, a, it's a entertainment. I know it's, we're being deceived. But we're not engaged in deception here. This is real science, real data. I then published a study in 2011, a follow-up study, which says a computer-automated, multi-center, multi-blinded, randomized control trial. Actually, this is not the... The, the study itself, this is the one that we're doing now. Let me stand corrected. The one that we did earlier in 2011, which used a similar paradigm, shows these results here, but it's the same basic idea, which is that the computer actually collects the data in the middle of the night, 
when no physical experimenter is present, and the, uh, uh, what's happened is, is that these, what we call them, again, hypothesized spirit participants or our test pilots, they will know to come to the laboratory in the middle of the night and then follow instructions given by PowerPoint. So in this particular experiment, there was one that was published in 2011, there was a 30 minute pre-baseline period, so we would know what the camera was looking at when no one was there. Then 30 minutes where they were invited to go inside the chamber. This is all done by computer automatically. And then a post period afterwards where no one was um, again in the box. And you can see there's a clear increase in the, the, the patterns of photons that were detected using what's called the fast Fourier transformation of the data. Now here's the experiment that we've been doing in the past nine months. And this is what has forced me to come to the conclusion that there's something very real going on here. So we here in this multi-centered experiment, we'll have two laboratories running at the same time. So this upper curve on the far right, you can see that there is a, a two, there are two screens here, which in this case shows a laboratory at the University of Arizona, one of the rooms in the, in the laboratory for this is a conscious and health. The one below it is a simultaneous laboratory where the data are being collected at the same time with a separate computer system in Ohio. So again, you can see that this is what it looks like in that space. Also, this, uh, this is a security camera system so we could know whether anybody is trying to go into the laboratory and, and potentially uh, muck with the equipment. Um, we also measure things like temperature and humility and uh, humidity and sound level in, in both rooms so we can compare the environmental variables. Here on the left is the uh, complex software that automatically collects the data that we're looking at plus uh, runs the entire experiment. And you'll notice it says here, was this your father's occupation? And it says priest. Um, and you'll notice that both sets show this at the same time. Because in this research, we did what we call a personal identification test. So imagine this. You have a hypothesized spirit sitting in a chair, and he's either in Arizona or he's in Ohio. How does, how does he know which laboratory to go to on a given night? Well, there's an evidential research medium who meets with the hypothesized team um, each, each twice a day actually in the morning and then at night. And she has the code, the secret code that tells them where on a given night to go. So let's say they're here in Arizona. So they'll be sitting in a chair with their hands over this box, their energy, info energy hands, following the instructions on the screen. There's another view of the camera, in this case with the camera from a different position. So you can see the chair and the, uh, and the box housing the equipment. Simultaneously, the computer over here is running the same, collecting the same data, but there's nobody there. So, and we, the experimenters, we're blind. We don't know which laboratory on a given night is the, if you would, active medication or the active laboratory, and which one is the placebo or the control. And on each night, they'll be in one of the two positions. And it's not until all 24 nights are completed that we uh, uh, then break the code and look and see whether or not you get positive results when they're in the, in the laboratory that they're supposed to be in and no, and no results um, when it was a control laboratory. Now, we said this is a personal identification test. And the reason is because the computer will ask, such as, is this your father's occupation? And it'll put up, let's say, priest, or it could put up doctor. Um, and depending upon the particular hypothesized spirit, one of these would fit them and one of them would not. It would ask, what is your father's name? Is this your father's name? Was this your mother's name? Was this your date of birth? Is this where you were born? Um, was this your occupation? Did you write this book? Um, uh, did you die of this disease and, or whatever cause of death? So by asking these personal identification questions, um, only somebody who knows those details would be able to accurately pass the test. 
So the question is, what happens when we do these kinds of double-blinded, multi-centered, you know, multi-laboratory, randomized control trials? Well, we did a total of six experiments. I'm just now submitting these findings for publication. Um, the, and basically, there were, there were two initial unblinded experiments. Look at the total number of sessions, 480 sessions or 320 sessions here for the second one. Or here we have uh, the PI stands for personal identification. These were two unblinded experiments. And then here, E and F are the actual experiments I've just told you about where they were now being done under completely blinded conditions. And in each case, and I, of course I don't have the opportunity to explain this to you, the predicted effect is to see a, a, an increased brightness and a plume of light in the middle of this particular region. And this is how it's graphed. And you'll notice that these blue lines, these blue arrows show that there's a peak, i.e. the predicted effect was observed in every single experiment. Total of six experiments, all producing the same replicated finding. And based on these findings, we're now embarking on uh, an experiment with uh, a, a research with six different laboratories in six different centers or universities, initially in this country, to independently replicate these findings. So, how might we explain these observations? Well, there are six alternative explanations for these kinds of findings. Very briefly, the first hypothesis is that it's a chance of result i.e. that you're playing with statistics or uh, it looks like it's significant, but it's not. However, when you do enough experiments and you use standard and responsible statistics and you find the same result again and again, you end up ruling out the chance hypothesis. The second possibility is that there's fraud involved. Um, and that somehow the mediums are cheating or the experimenters are cheating or the computers are hacked or something. Um, this is a very important question. And so we go to great lengths to, to make fraud virtually impossible. Uh, you can never completely rule out fraud, but what you could do is make it so improbable that it's no longer a plausible explanation. So, for example, we use two computers per laboratory. We use multiple security systems, both live webcams and uh, time-lapse photography, but actual um, um, uh, secret accounts and secret cloud storage um, so that you could track whether anyone was attempting to, uh, to uh, tinker with the data. Um, all of this is automatically stored um, and then analyzed using a very formal procedure, which any scientist could look at and confirm that what we did was correct. So if you rule out essentially fraud, then the third possibility is that there's experimenter error. There's some, there's some mistake in the way the experiment was designed or the way it was run. But this research has been, has been reviewed by over 12 senior scientists. We have looked um, and, and you know, you get a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion. We've gotten more than 12 opinions. We've tried to see whether or not there's any possibility that this could be explained due to some sort of experimental design error. And no one has come up with, a, uh, with something that could account for this. So if we eliminate these three um, mainstream explanations, we then consider um, ones that are more controversial and speculative. The fourth is what's called super psi. And super psi are speculations by parapsychologists that the mind, and in particular the unconscious mind, can sometimes um, interfere with experiments. So their hypothesis goes that this medium, for example, who is secretly meeting with this hypothesized team, that there's really no team actually manipulating the data. What's happening is that when she goes to sleep at night, or he, that his or her unconscious mind goes to the particular laboratory and for eight hours attempts to mimic what the 
uh, what the hypothesized spirit participants would do and make the equi equipment look as if it was producing positive results when in fact it was the medium's mind. Uh, that is a speculation um, and there is, un unfortunately uh, for parapsychologists, there's no actual experimental evidence that this kind of a task in the middle of the night could be so influenced. However, to further minimize that, in the research that we're about to start doing with the independent laboratories, we're actually going to be using skeptic investigators, skeptic experimenters to create the codes. And they will then be interacting with a remote computer system, which will then inform our hypothesized uh, participants, spirit participants, as to which laboratory to go. So if anybody's mind is, going to, is knowing what's going on and is going to be influencing the equipment, it's going to be the skeptics and the skeptics could be, are not going to want to produce positive results. If anything, they don't believe that any of this is possible at all. They don't believe in parapsychology. They don't believe in the spirit hypothesis. So theoretically, the effect should disappear. Um, however, of course, we predict that the effect will still be there. Then even more speculative is the notion that, well, maybe they're imposters. So maybe there are spirits, but these spirits are uh, mimicking the, uh, the, the hypothesized team. They're, they're tricksters, they're aliens, they're, um, they're, uh, they want to cause humanity problems. Um, certain religious people hold such a view. Um, and for the record, there is, there's no way to right now address that question. However, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if you're going to make an extraordinary claim for super psi, or you're going to make an extraordinary claim for imposters, the same responsibility falls on you or whoever this person is that's making this, this claim to then provide experimental evidence to support your hypothesis. Anybody can make a claim. Anybody can make a prediction. The question is, can you design science that will address that hypothesis? And as I've already said, there is so much research from other areas, including, as we said, near-death experience, reincarnation research, and um, controlled mediumship experiments, which can't be explained by those hypotheses. So finally, there's the sixth one, that there really is spirit collaboration and communication, and that this technology research is providing a capstone for that hypothesis. So that then moves on to part five, we're almost done. I call this a Wright Brothers moment um, in the history of science. And we have to talk about the distinction between proof of concept to proof of product. Now, as you know, over a hundred years ago, prior to Kitty Hawk, and this photograph was literally taken at Kitty Hawk in I think it was December of 1903, prior to this historic moment, um, humans did not know whether they could fly with powered uh, you know, technology. No one had ever succeeded to do so. People had tried and failed and some people had died. But on that fateful day, that cold day, five people witnessed this plane take off. The first flight, I think, was all of 12 seconds. The longest was maybe 29 seconds or only four that day. And then the plane crashed. They had to rebuild it. The next time they tried to do it a few months later, um, there wasn't enough breeze. The plane couldn't get off the ground and it crashed. And then they had to repair it. Then the third time they tried, again, there was enough breeze. And that plane took off. And for the few people who saw this, even though it was considered to be unbelievable by the by most of us in the general public. Um, the fact was that this research showed that flight was possible. Not that it was practical, not that you could actually use it, but it did show that in principle, proof of concept, flight was possible. From there, a lot more money and more time had to be spent 
with more sophisticated engineers and so on to go from proof of concept to proof of product. But because we had the proof of concept, there was then the incentive to go to proof of product. And what I am proposing is that we're having another Wright Brothers moment. I'm suggesting to you that it's no longer a question of is spirit communication possible? That is no longer the question scientifically, especially when the replication of the multicenter study is completed. The question is now, can it, turn it be turned into something practical? Can we develop what we call the soul phone, a device where you'll be able to initially, with, by texting, be able to text your loved ones who have transitioned, who have, quote, relocated to another dimension, um, uh, and eventually have FaceTime and Zoom time, video and auditory, auditory information, just like we're doing now. So how might these discoveries change the world? Well, there are so many areas that would be affected if we knew 100% that life after death was real. First of all, there would be an end of the fear of death. We would no longer have to fear death because there was no death. There was only transition. Just as energy uh, and information, uh, well, energy in particular, energy can't be destroyed, it can only be transformed. Our energy and information, in principle, cannot be, quote, destroyed. What it can be done is transformed. And our light is like the light from distant stars. It continues long after the star has, quote, died. We would no longer have to fear death. We could take a long view. And if we have a cell phone technology, we would therefore be able to stay in contact with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and continue to be part of our lives if we so chose. There would be an increased motivation for caring and compassion, because now we would realize that the number one thing that we do is, is, is to promote kindness and, and love and um, facilitate goodness in the world, and that we can't escape the, the unfortunate or bad things that we might have done simply because we, quote, die. Uh, your consciousness changes. That's why we called the, our book the, the, the Big Picture of Life, the book for children. And then there'll be major opportunities and major transformations for the legal system and justice for all, for wills and intellectual property, changes in education and consulting. Could you imagine consulting with distinguished scientists like Albert Einstein, and David Bohm, or Nikola Tesla, or Albert Einstein, or great business leaders or whatever? who still care about humanity and being of service for the greater good? And what about even entertainment from the other side? I do want to get back to the legal system and justice for all, because I want you to imagine, if you could, just like we had to imagine that we could go from the Wright brothers plane that you couldn't do any with to, a, to large jet planes that fly all around the world 24 seven, although not as frequently during this current pandemic, which we all take for granted, and millions and millions of us fly like this every year. Well, imagine that we now have technology. So literally, a person can be seen sitting in a chair, holographically produced, a loved one from the other side, and be also able to hear them. And imagine that this person that you see sitting here was someone who had been recently murdered. And he was there. And now he has the opportunity using this technology, if our legal system will allow it, he will have the opportunity to testify at his own trial, the trial based on his death. He will be able to be examined and cross-examined. And therefore, a jury has more information to be able to judge who was responsible for the person's death. As difficult and as challenging as that question is, all of this becomes possible with, if this technology goes from proof of concept to proof of product. So cell phone science is providing us with a historic opportunity. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you, uh, you can 
visit, learn about the Laboratory of Advances and Conscious Health at the University of Arizona. As you can see, it's a picture of myself and Rhonda, my, uh, my beloved and, and partner in all of this. And there is a, an organization called the Soul Phone Foundation, which was created by Dr. Mark Pitstick. And with it, we have a large board of advisors to help raise funding and raise awareness for the great opportunity that is facing all of us. So I think I've now finished and hopefully within the time allotted.